have four kids, and they all love math and logic puzzles. At the beginning of the school year, I asked them why they love math and logic puzzles so much, and my 11-year-old answered, it's because I'm a detective, it's because I'm a problem solver, and I love to solve problems about the world. And so succinctly, my 11-year-old summed up what I've been feeling my entire career, that I have mysteries and problems that I want to solve, and the way I'm going to do it is by learning as much about machine learning as I possibly can. So why is machine learning the right tool to solve these mysteries in genomics and biology and medicine? Well, I think in order to think about this, we need to first discuss the two cultures in machine learning right now. So Leo Breiman was a professor at UC Berkeley where I did my PhD in statistics, and he's well known for building methods and models uh, like a random forest that solve real world problems in an elegant way. He passed away in 2005, and in his obituary, he's quoted as saying to students, remember that the great adventure of statistics is in gathering and using data to solve interesting and important real world problems. So he was clearly a detective too. In 2001, Leo Breiman wrote a paper called Statistical Modeling, the Two Cultures. And in this paper, he describes the two cultures in machine learning, one of which I'm going to refer to as the black box, which Leo Breiman was advocating, and the other one I'm going to call the open box. So when we think about analyzing data in the real world, let's say we have an observation X. This observation could be a picture on the internet. It could be the fMRI scan from a patient. And then we have some Y, which could be the label for that observation. So the image on the internet might be labeled as cat, or the fMRI scan might be labeled as bipolar disorder or healthy. So in the black box approach to modeling these data, we're going to use something like a decision tree or neural networks to, in a brute force way, model the relationship between X and Y. OK, because it's brute force, because we don't even attempt to model nature, it's a black box. We can't open it up. And we also need a lot of data to be able to model this relationship without actually pretending to model nature. The open box approach is quite different. So we use very simplified models like factor analysis, linear and logistic regression, and canonical correlation analysis to try and approximate nature. We essentially build a scaffold based on what we think is the relationship between X and Y, and then fill that scaffold in using data. The good news is that it takes a lot less data, but the bad news is that we really need to know something about our, our domain that we're working in to be able to build this scaffold appropriately. So if we're using a black box method to try and label pictures on the internet, let's say we start out with 100,000 labeled images, uh, some of which have cat and some of which don't. Uh, then when we see a new picture on the internet with high accuracy, we can label this image cat. So Brad Efron, who is a very distinguished statistician, wrote a response to the Two Cultures paper advocating the open box approach. And in his response, he says, the whole point of science is to open up black boxes, understand their insides, and build better boxes for the purposes of mankind. And I think this succinctly encapsulates exactly what I think about this open box approach, where we need to open the box, model nature, and see what's going on inside, see what we've learned from the data. So now, if I apply the open box approach to trying to label images on the internet, I might see this image of a cat again, and I might say it's a cat and not a hippopotamus because it has a beautiful structure that looks like a cat. The nose is exactly a cat's nose. The fur is a repeated pattern that is in the shape of a cat. It has fuzzy ears. It has a tail. It looks like a cat. So I'm explaining why I'm giving it this label of cat. But for this particular problem, we don't care why. The label is the most important thing. The same is not true if you have an fMRI scan of a patient. We can't just say this patient has bipolar disorder or not. We need to know why. We need to know what it is about that fMRI scan that allows us to give this patient a diagnosis. So how do we actually open the box then in these biomedical problems? Well, let's say we're studying a, a rare brain disease and we have maybe 10,000 patients in the world at all with this brain disease. That's not enough patients, even if we can see them all, to be able to use black box methods to diagnose these patients, just because the signals that differentiate this brain disease from every other brain disease are going to be very, very difficult to find. 
So the, the open box method instead builds a scaffold of all the possible ways that small numbers of genes and biomarkers and fMRI scan images can maybe be responsible for this label, this disease. And by using just a small amount of data and this representative scaffold, we can narrow down the causes for this disease very effectively using a few samples, a small number of data points. So these open box methods allow us to search for causes and mechanisms and patterns in the data. And then as detectives, we have to look at those patterns, open the box, and figure out what those patterns represent in terms of biology. So how do we do this detective work? Given that we have patterns, that we find patterns in these complex data sets, we can now attach each of those patterns to specific processes in the cell that lead to disease and the effects of those diseases back on the cell. And once we know these, we can start thinking about labeling causes, figuring out how to draw diagnoses out of early stage patients with a particular disease, and then treatments that treat the disease and not necessarily the symptoms. So let's go in a little bit deeper to this open box approach for the problem of thinking about gene expression levels. So let's say I have 500 patients and gene expression levels for those patients in the 20,000 genes that may be expressed in whole blood. So this will be a whole blood sample. But instead of gene expression levels, I should say we can be talking about genotypes from people across the world or uh, lab and vital signs uh, from patients in a hospital. So let's say then that we can also separate our group of patients into those with heart disease and those without heart disease. So the first thing we might do with an open box method is compute the average gene expression levels for those 20,000 genes for the patients with heart disease and the average gene expression levels for those without heart disease. And then we can compare those averages very naively to see which genes express differently in the heart disease versus the not heart disease patients. But in my work, we go a step further. Uh, and if you think about each of these patients, none of their gene expression levels will be exactly like the mean, the average. But there's patterns hidden in how the genes vary from the average. So in particular now, I can think about pairs and groups of genes that differ from the average gene expression levels in a coordinated way. And this coordination gives us clues about what's going on in the data. So what could these coordinated patterns represent? Well, sometimes it's, it's biological information that we can use. So for example, it's possible that some genes vary from the average because there's different proportions of immune cells in those patients, which may mean they've started to fight an infection. It could be because there's rare genetic mutation in some of these patients that actually upregulate two or three genes in just those patients. It could be because there's some cells that have already started a precancerous program, and you can already see the evidence of this in the changes in a handful of cells away from the mean. Differences from the mean could also come about because two samples were run on different machines, or actually a different technician in the lab prepared the samples slightly differently. These could be representative of biological factors about the patients, like their age, their sex, or their ethnicity. They could even be lifestyle choices. So we found genes that vary from the average according to whether the patient uh, was a tobacco smoker or not. So this really encapsulates why this open box approach is so powerful in medicine to me, because a limited number of samples can find these hidden patterns of variation. And then with detective work, we can actually put labels, name each of those patterns of variation according to their causes and their biological sources. So I want to tell you quickly about three success stories uh, about open box science uh, that came out of my group recently. So the first one involves a paper uh, that was published last week, and the goal of the paper was to describe how mutations in a genome impact expression levels differently across healthy human tissues, 44 healthy human tissues. And my role in this project was to consider mutations, identify mutations in the genome uh, that affected gene expression levels for genes that were not located on the same chromosome as that mutation. So we have 23 chromosomes in humans. And let's think about what this actually involved. So there's 4 million measurements of mutations in a genome. We were thinking across 44 different human tissue types. There are 20,000 expressed genes in each of these tissue types. So we melted our core by running 3.5 trillion statistical tests to identify what ended up being only about 500 associations, OK? So um, let's actually look at one of those associations and talk about what we did to follow up on this. 
So in thyroid cells, we found that there's a mutation that affects the gene expression levels of two genes off of the chromosome uh, and only in thyroid. Uh, sorry, this is a scatter plot of the 44 different tissues, and that top one, the green one, is uh, thyroid. This is actually a, a sample, a tissue sample from one of our donors in this project of their thyroid. And when we found this association, it was very exciting because it turns out that this mutation in previous study has been associated with a higher risk of thyroid cancer. So it feels like we're onto something here. So being a detective, we looked around the region of this mutation on the genome, and we found that there's a gene really close to this mutation called FOXY1. So FOXY1 is special because it's a thyroid-specific tr transcription factor, which means it's only expressed in thyroid tissues, and that when it's upregulated in thyroid tissues, that there's a cascading effect, and many other genes in thyroid are also upregulated. So this was really exciting. Again, we feel like we're onto something. But when we looked at our black box statistical methods that throw away all of the variation that can't be explained, we couldn't find any association between the mutation and FOXY1 and all of these genes that it's supposed to affect. That's when we opened the box. We applied these statistical methods that allow us to go in and, and query what's going on here. And not only did we find an association between the mutation and FOXY1 and many genes downstream, but we were able to replicate this signal in a sample uh, of 500 cancer, tumor cancer patients with, with uh, thyroid cancer, which is quite astounding for signals this, this small. So the second story I wanted to tell you about has to do with the genomics of tissues. So for the exact same study that I'm talking about, we actually had slides of tissue samples, pathology images, from about 2,000 of the samples that were matched with gene expression levels. So these samples represent tissue samples from a, from a donor, where they stain them and put them under a microscope and take a, a photograph of them. And that's what you're seeing here. These are cerebellum and cerebral cortex samples. So what we did by opening the box this time was actually find not just coordinated patterns of variation in gene expression, but uh, small sets of genes that were coordinated with image features. So in other words, when these uh, uh, genes were differential, uh, so were these sets of image features. And again, opening the box, we were able to, as far as I know, for the first time, identify a mutation that in uh, individuals with two copies of that mutation uh, have brain tissue that looks one way, and zero copies of that mutation have brain tissues that look another way. And we were able to do the exact same thing uh, with a muscle mutation for muscle tissue, where individuals with two copies of that mutation had muscle tissue that looked quite different from individuals with zero copies of that mutation. So the third story is about open box machine learning to assist doctors. So here we're collaborating with doctors at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital, and they gave us access to 270,000 patients in their inpatient setting, in the hospital setting. And our goal in this study was to learn how to recommend to a doctor uh, when to remove a patient from a ventilator, from a mechanical ventilator. So doctors are conservative when they remove a patient from a ventilator because they, they don't want to have to re-ventilate that patient, understandably. Uh, but there's actually a negative impact to keeping a patient on a ventilator too long. They may develop infection or dependency. Um, and so, of course, our machine learning method, which was able to look across these 270,000 patients, uh, can start uh, giving doctors recommendations. But if you're a doctor, there's no reason you'd accept uh, a machine telling you what to do because the machine hasn't been to med school like you have. You need some evidence that it's the right thing to do at that time. So along with this recommendation, our system tells the doctors what signs, what vital signs and what lab results, what about the patient's state. It gives it a reason to recommend that it's time to remove a patient from a ventilator. In other words, in the, all the patients that this machine has seen so far, how do the signs and symptoms suggest that this patient is going to do well off of a ventilator? And then how can I communicate that to a doctor so that they will follow this recommendation? And this is a particular example where 40 hours before the doctor removed this patient from a ventilator, our recommendation system said it was probably safe to do so. So I'm going to very briefly tell you about uh, two of the methods that I use in open box uh, machine learning. One is called sparse factor analysis. So this Y matrix is exactly the matrix that I've been talking about, where we have have samples or patients or donors and 20,000 gene expression levels. Everything after the equal sign is what we have to learn in this scaffolded model of nature. 
okay? And in particular, when you think about these, uh, the, the columns of my lambda matrix, the K columns, each of those are gonna be a component of the variation. In other words, they're gonna be a subset of coordinated genes that differ together. And the key about that is that there's only gonna be a small number of genes. So once I fit this model, I can go back and look at each of those K components, find those small sets of genes that have coordinated variation, and dig into it using my detective work and my understanding of biology to understand what is going wrong with those particular sets of genes. So sparse canonical correlation analysis takes this one step further and not only finds small sets of genes, but also coordinates that with another type of observation. In this case, we looked at image features. And now it's not only finding sets of genes that differ coordinated way, but sets of image features that are also coordinated. And this allows us to actually pair multiple data types and multiple data sources. So that's very exciting. So there's two real difficulties in applying these methods to real data problems. Uh, and the first one is you need to actually know a lot about the domain you're working on or else you can't build this scaffold in the appropriate way and you can't do the detective work in a precise way. That I can't solve for you. But the other one is that the availability of these methods is not as ubiquitous as, for example, deep learning is right now. So there's a lot of software tools that allow you to do this, but not a lot that allow you to do sparse canonical correlation analysis. So I'm working with software engineers right now to try and get these methods developed free for use for everyone, and I hope that people in science will take me up on it. So now I want to tell you about the next question I want to answer, the next why I want to find out. So last March, my mother passed away from complications due to Lewy body dementia. Uh, LBD is a neurodegenerative disease uh, where you have symptoms that include memory and behavioral problems and uh, Parkinsonian-like stiffness in your muscles. You shuffle a lot. Lewy body dementia is Im impossible to diagnose before death, so you have to die and have an autopsy to definitively find this diagnosis. And how you find it is that you have a brain tissue like the one you see above with a Lewy body in it, which is that brown blob. The problem is that even if you give drugs to treat Lewy body dementia, none of them actually treat the causes because we don't really know the causes of Lewy body dementia. And in fact, if we treat the symptoms, often these drugs are counterindicated. So if you try and treat the Parkinsonian-like symptoms, the memory and behavioral symptoms get worse and vice versa. So I think we have a lot of the data that we actually need to start putting the pieces together and solving this problem in an, in an open box way. So in other words, we have mutations that are related to dementia, broadly defined, not necessarily Lewy body, from uh, genome-wide association studies. We understand how mutations affect brain cells and tissues from this work that I told you about earlier. And we have a lot of images of post-mortem individuals from autopsies of people with Lewy body dementia. So I feel like we just need to build these open box models to be able to put the pieces together. And then in an iterative way, start building new models, new scaffolds of, of how we might uh, uh, generate new hypotheses from the signals, the patterns that we're finding in these data. And maybe even go out and produce some enabling data to answer the questions more directly. But the implications of doing this, of putting these pieces together, are gigantic. If we can figure out the causes, whether genetic or environmental, of Lewy body dementia, if we can diagnose these patients, not after death, but 12 years before they actually end up dying from Lewy body, and if we can treat not just the symptoms, but the causes of Lewy body dementia, we're talking about solving diseases here, which is uh, something I think really important. Everyone, every one of us, just by nature of being human, is curious, and there are specific questions we have about the world uh, and about nature, and I hope that you will think next time you have a question that you'd like to solve and a mystery you'd like to address, that you think about using the tools in open box science to be able to build boxes for the betterment of mankind. Thank you.